I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily. He's a man on the run, but he can't hide from Crime Watch Daily. It completely and utterly destroyed me. This woman says he's a monster, a Chicago tanning salon owner accused of horrible crimes. You're shaking. It's okay. No one can hurt you now. Sorry. Today, one of his victims bravely comes forward, giving her first interview to our Elizabeth Smart. As a rape survivor myself, I will never forget the feelings of filth. What happens when we show up at his door? I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. Then, if your child went missing, you'd do anything to find them, wouldn't you? So why won't this mother cooperate with police? Julia, why won't you cooperate with the investigation? Julia. My son is, is not here, and I don't know where he is. A heartbroken father desperate for answers. A mother in hiding. Wait until you hear how she says her two-year-old son, Sky vanished. What parent would leave their child in the car and walk a mile to the gas station? It's a story our Jason Matera won't let go. Sky was your son? You won't talk to cops? Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. This. Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily. I'm Chris Hansen. We start with the story of a two-year-old boy named Sky. He vanished after his mom says she left him for more than an hour in the back seat of a car. Our Jason Matera has the story. Yeah, Chris, this case has really haunted the tight-knit city of Bellevue. Police here tell me that they've spent more than 14,000 hours and more than $2 million trying to find little Sky. Julia, why is this mother running from my questions? Jason Matero with Crime Watch Daily. What does she have to hide? Why won't you cooperate with the investigation, Julia? Shouldn't she want to help in any way possible to find her missing son? Come on, Julia. And maybe the most pressing question, why is she calling the cops on me when the cops are dying to talk to her? You call the cops, but yet you don't want to cooperate with the police? It all starts with a loving two-year-old. He was like a boy boy. Loved to jump on me when he was older. And his dad, Solomon, says it's his big brown eyes that can melt any heart. He was just, just, just pure love. But what happened to Sky Metawala on a chilly November day in Washington state is now a mystery that has investigators scratching their heads and has everyone else pointing fingers. Our community wants justice if something really happened to Sky. Sky's father, born in Pakistan, met his wife, Julia Buryakova, out of all places, a gas station. What attracted you to Julia? Her, her looks, of course. She's, she's beyond beautiful. Julia, a teenager at the time who was born in the Ukraine, and Solomon, hit it off immediately. You said she was the love of your life. She was very giving. She also was very supportive. The two quickly married and had a daughter named Miley. But Solomon started to notice some strange things about his new wife. She would obsessively clean the house three to four hours a day, seven days a week. Okay, this is this, this cannot cannot be normal. But that I I didn't really understand that until you know now. And as a mother, Solomon says Julia was really starting to struggle. Only thing Julia had to do was get up in the morning, get Molly dressed, and take her to daycare, and that's it, you know. But she couldn't do it. After Sky was born, Solomon knew his wife needed help, especially after he heard these chilling words from his young daughter. Miley started to say, I want to kill myself. Because Julia was saying it so much when she was around Miley. That must have been completely disturbing to you. Yes, it was. Then, according to court documents, Solomon received a terrifying text from his wife that said in part, quote, I cannot live another day. I am dead on the inside anyway and have been dead for a long time. Julia was immediately committed to a hospital. Months later, after changing medication, she seemed to be turning things around. 
Kaif was good. Kaif was good. Life just got way good. <laughs> but that didn't last long. Julia's tortured ritual of cleaning the house got even worse. Now she was up to six hours a day, and she even forced the family to eat outside. It was just very, very bad. Solomon says he had no other choice but to divorce Julia and take custody of the kids. But Julia wasn't going to let that happen without a fight. Julia and her husband were in the middle of a bitter custody battle. David Rose, host of Washington's Most Wanted, covered every brutal blow. They were going back and forth on who would have custody of Skye and his sister. Both of them had protection orders against each other, and the kids were caught right in the middle of this. Julia told the court that Solomon was not telling the truth about her mental illness and obsessive cleaning, and then she lobbed some very ugly accusations toward him. After the separation, Julia said that you had abused the children. When she told me that, I go, what are you talking about? In court documents, she also claimed Solomon beat both children and her with a wooden spoon, a detail backed up by an independent witness. Most disturbing of all, she even claimed Solomon sexually abused his daughter. Why would she say that? A CPS investigation found that claim to be unfounded, and Solomon vehemently denies any and all abuse allegations. He even took a lie detector test and passed. Still, the judge awarded full custody to his wife. What was that like to have your kids taken from you? I mean, you just killed my whole family. Because of the nature of the allegations, Solomon would go a full year without seeing Sky or Miley. Then Julia finally gives in and sets up a time. I was going to see them that Wednesday. Sadly, that reunion would never happen. Just days after their new agreement, Sky suddenly disappears in the most unbelievable way. His mom said that Sky was sick that morning, so she was going to take him to the doctor in Bellevue. On the way to the doctor, Julia claims that the vehicle had some kind of car trouble, ran out of gas, or just wouldn't run. Julia tells police she grabs her four-year-old daughter, Miley, and walks a mile to the nearest gas station for help. But what about two-year-old Sky? Well, the strange thing is, she left that little boy in the car seat in the back by himself. She goes to the gas station. She doesn't get gas. She calls a friend to come get her. They go back to the car and Sky is gone. What parent would leave their child in the car and walk a mile to the gas station? Lieutenant Dave DeVore is one of the lead detectives in Sky's disappearance. And the child was reportedly sick, right? Exactly. Does that make sense to you? No, it does not. Something Bellevue Chief of Police Steve Milet has a hard time understanding as well. You're a father. If your child isn't feeling well, do you just leave him abandoned on the side of the road and then walk to a gas station? It's a great question. It's a great question. What's going through your mind when the police officers say that Sky has gone missing? I think uh, you're in a shock, so your, your, your brain doesn't think. Bellevue police would launch a massive search for Sky, but it didn't take long for investigators to find cracks in Julia's story. We started recognizing that there was some inconsistencies that caused us to step back and reevaluate whether or not this was something that involved foul play. Ms. Barakova had reported that the vehicle had mechanical problems, turned out to be not true. Um, it had plenty of gas in the tank. So there was gas still in the car and nothing mechanically wrong with it? Correct. That's exactly the opposite of what Julia said? Correct. So how would Julia explain that? Well, investigators would never get a chance to ask her. She was brought down to the station where we were going to do some follow-up discussions. Her attorney came in, and that was the end of our contact with her. A little boy missing, a mother not talking, a father desperately searching for answers. Do you believe her? Hell no. What part of her story does it ring true? All of it. Coming up, what really happened to Little Sky? Was it a real life version of his mom's favorite television show, Law and Order SVU? There are a lot of people in this community that believe that Sky was never in that car in the first place. And I go knocking on the door of the one person who holds the key to this mystery, Julia Buryakova. Why won't you cooperate with the investigation, Julia? 
Did Uber know that you were a registered sex I'm offender? Sorry, you have a chance right now to look into that camera. Did you have anything to do with yes. Sid's disappearance? Get out of my property. The Crime Watch Daily has never been afraid to get in your face and ask the tough questions. Today, our Jason Matera is on the case of a missing little boy. For some reason, his mother has been ignoring the police, but she can't ignore us. How does a happy-go-lucky two-year-old boy simply vanish off the earth? My son is, is not here, and I don't know where he is. Did the little boy get kidnapped? Those kind of things just don't happen in that community. David Rose, host of Washington's Most Wanted, has covered the disappearance of Sky Metawala from day one. People are frustrated, and they wonder how could somebody do something to a little boy like this, or how could a little boy just vanish? Making things even more troubling, the mounting evidence that foul play may have been involved. And the one person who could help solve this case isn't talking. Julia holds the key to this case, and we beg her to come forward and talk to us. Julia is Skye's mother, who claims Skye was sick the day of his disappearance. And as she drove him and his four-year-old sister to the hospital, she reportedly had car trouble. Julia told police that her car ran out of gas at this intersection, so she decided to leave her two-year-old son in the car alone and walk to the nearest gas station, which is about a mile away. When she returned to the car more than an hour later, Sky was gone. Why would she walk a mile with her daughter in the cold of a November morning to a gas station? It doesn't make sense. Investigators agree. In fact, a long list of troubling facts started to surface. First, officers say the car had nothing wrong with it. It had plenty of gas in the tank. In fact, we drove the vehicle, and we drove it for a long period of time. Fact number two, she and her ex-husband Solomon were in the middle of a nuclear-sized divorce war. Julia leveling claims of child abuse, and Solomon maintaining she suffered from severe mental illness. We've had, you know, um, conversations about, okay, you need to go get help. And her response was, you know, I'm fine. Fact number three. This wasn't the first time Little Sky would be left in a car. Two years earlier, Julia and Solomon were both cited by police after locking the little boy in a car while they went shopping inside a Target for 55 minutes. You're clearly remorseful for leaving Sky in the car in 2009. You just said it was dumb, inexcusable. Right, 100%. And lastly, fact number four, perhaps the strangest of all, the night before Sky went missing, Law & Order SVU aired an episode where a mother tried covering up the death of her child by claiming the kid was abducted from a parked car. The show is reportedly Julia's favorite program. I think it's very possible that little Sky was never in the vehicle that day and that Julia made up the entire story to cover up something horrible. Solomon hadn't seen either of his kids in more than a year because of their ugly divorce, and he believes Sky was never in that car. So when was the last time that somebody outside of Julia's family saw Sky? It was six months before the, um, the day he went missing. Do you have any theories about what happened to Sky? At this point, I am thinking somehow she sold him. To who? We would love to know that, wouldn't we? There's been some chatter that maybe Julia smuggled Sky out of the country, that he maybe is in Ukraine. I will say that that has been followed up on and that we have uh, closed that loop. It has now been nearly five years since Sky went missing. Julia has lost custody of their daughter, Miley. Does Julia hold the key to unlocking the mystery of Skye's disappearance? My God, yes, she does. She does. She's the only person we haven't been able to talk to. And again, I'm begging you, please come forward and talk to us. Police are now calling Julia a person of interest in the case. And the only thing Julia has said since Skye's disappearance came back in 2011 in several angry emails to ABC News correspondent Neil Karlinski, in which she stated, quote, my former husband is a sadistic Muslim Pakistani. No one has any idea. This is all too difficult. What about what Skye's father, Solomon, has he been cooperative with the investigation? Very cooperative. I have four children. And all I can tell you, I know what my response would be. But that being said, I don't know why she will not come forward. Well, since Julia won't go and talk to the police, 
we decided to go to her. Julia's heading to the trunk of her car. Julia, Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. Why won't you cooperate with the police? Why won't you cooperate with the police with the investigation for Sky? We're doing a story on Sky's disappearance. Are you trying to hide something? Why won't you cooperate with the investigation, Julia? Sky was your son? It's been now almost six years? You won't talk to cops? She calls the cops on us. It's odd that a mom doesn't want to talk about their missing son. You call the cops, but yet you don't want to cooperate with the police? They want the police help now. But when it comes to Sky's disappearance, not so much. You think Julia may have seen too much of you in Sky and then taken it out on him? I don't want anyone to think that. That would be horrible. Do you believe your son is still alive? I'm gonna believe that he is because no one can prove me he's not. As for police, they have released new pictures of Julie at the gas station from the day of Skye's reported disappearance, hoping to get new leads, as well as this new age progression photo of what the two-year-old would look like today. And to say this case is a personal one for investigators would be an understatement. Look at this little boy. Look at him. He's two years old. He could be your son. He could be my son. I commend you and this program for bringing this case forward and keeping it alive. What would finding Sky mean to you personally? Get on my knees and just thank God that we were able to find him. And I get on my knees and I pray that he's alive. Until that day, Chief Steve Milet makes us this promise. This picture will stay on my desk for as long as I'm chief and beyond. And we're gonna keep on searching and following every lead until we bring him home and return him to his family. And to do that, they need an interview with Julia Buryakova. However, she's had quite the past 12 months. She gave birth to a new baby boy, but she was declared an unfit parent by Child Protective Services. We saw the baby, though, still with her. As for the father, his name is Alan Morgan, and he's a convicted felon. They both have court orders not to see each other. Coming up, the Chicago tanning salon owner police call a serial rapist. Mark! Mark Winner! Our Elizabeth Smart is chasing him down and talking to one of his victims. I question what I was wearing, what I was doing. Then a celebration turns to horror as a gunman rips through a high school house party to get revenge on his ex-girlfriend. There's people laying on the ground outside like that are dead. The clues he dropped on social media moments before the attack. That's coming up. All right, now to a story that will send chills up the spine of any woman who's ever been to a tanning salon. And to cover it for us, we sent in the ultimate victim's advocate our own Elizabeth Smart. She joins me now. Hi, Elizabeth. Chris, it was one of the most popular tanning salons in Chicago, but police say the owner was using it to prey on employees and customers. He is the man who has several women in the Chicago area screaming rape. Mark Winner. Ah. Free on the streets. Crime Watch Daily is there after his most recent status hearing. Winner's facing charges on four vicious rapes over six years. He's pled not guilty to all counts, most of them allegedly perpetrated on customers and employees of his now shut down tanning salons. I literally became a, com a person nobody recognized. I wasn't me anymore. She is Leslie Barton, a former career political consultant and the first woman to step forward and accuse Winner of raping her on top of a tanning bed in his salon. It nearly completely and utterly destroyed me. Crime Watch Daily special correspondent Elizabeth Smart knows better than anyone what it is like to be a survivor of violent sexual abuse. At age 14, kidnapped, raped, and tortured over nine months while police searched for her. Today, she is a champion. You're shaking. It's okay. No one can hurt you now. For victims of sexual abuse in their fight for justice. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. 
Leslie is sharing her nightmare for the first time on national television and only with Elizabeth. Did he say anything to you when you were saying no meant no and I don't want this? He just ignored you? Ignored it completely. Did not acknowledge it. I didn't exist. Leslie Barton says her nightmare began at one of Mark Winner's tanning salons on Chicago's North Shore. It's a different name now. Um, it's still a tanning salon. It was called the Tanning Oasis. Is it hard for you to be back? It's not easy. She says she asked Winner if a friend could use her membership for one day at the salon. He turned and looked at me, he's like, no, you can't and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. Later that evening, she says she visits a neighborhood bar with a friend. And I was at this, you know, cheers type place near my house that everyone really does know your name. And she's surprised to see a neighbor sitting there with Mark Winner. I said, you screamed at me as a customer in your tanning salon. I said, you really need to get that anger under control. And then he started it very angry again. Really? And I just, I walked away. When who should appear moments later but Mark Winner, with a peace offering in his hand. He shows up with a drink. And he said, you know what, you're right. I'm so sorry. And then in what Leslie will forever remember as the biggest mistake in her life, she says she took the offered drink from Winner. And I drank maybe half of it. And I sat and talked to them for a while. It was already pretty late. And I was really getting, like, kind of tired. So you're feeling pretty sure then that he had drugged your drink? I, pretty sure. I can never prove it. I mean, it never felt like this. It was this fog, mm -hmm. this strange fog. She says Winner then offered to take her out for food. And I'm like, um, no, I don't think so. He's like, come on, I know your, your neighbor. You go to my tanning salon. She agrees to go and then says Mark Winner pulls the car up to a stop, not at a restaurant, but at his tanning salon. I'm like, where are we? He has me walk in first. He's behind me and so my back's to him. And I hear the turn of the lock. So he's locked you in with him. And at that moment, my whole body cringed. I mean, everything in me just went, it just stopped. I lose time again. And when I woke up, I'm standing inside one of the tanning rooms. And I turn around and I see him and he's standing in the doorway blocking my way out. Leslie says she tried to force her way past him, but that's when Mark Winner made his move. And he lifted me up and slammed me down on the tanning bed. And he's strangling me. What was going through your mind when he grabbed your neck? And I'm thinking, this isn't happening. This can't be happening. He's going to kill me. I'm certain of it. He's going to kill me. And he just squeezes tighter and tighter around my neck. I wanted to live. I wanted to live. I, some, I somehow gurgled out, you stop, stop. I'll, I'll stop fighting. And then he got back on me and he raped me. I just no longer existed in that moment. I was gone. Next. <sighs> Deep breath. <laughs> Leslie Barton faces the gut-wrenching decision. Speak out or stay silent. My identity, my self-worth, it was just taken in an instant. Mark Winner. And Elizabeth goes on the hunt for Mark Winner. We're back with more on the case of the tanning salon owner accused of sexually assaulting employees and customers. To the horror of those alleged victims, that suspect remains out on the streets while he awaits trial. Let's head back to Chicago where our Elizabeth Smart tried to get his side of the story. It's the morning after the most horrific night of Leslie Barton's life. I had no idea why I was so absolutely terrified of everything. I 
just severe post-traumatic stress. Hi. And she's sharing her nightmare of being raped for the first time on national television with our Elizabeth Smart. What happened after the attack? I couldn't barely speak, and my neck is killing me. Her physical scars pale compared to the emotional trauma. And look in the mirror, and there's like fingerprints of bruises all around my neck, everywhere. When the shadow would go past the window, I'd jump. And then the next day I said to my friend, I said, I'm getting flashbacks, I'm starting to get my memory back. I said, I think I was raped. Leslie claims she was raped on a tanning bed in a tanning salon and says this is the man who attacked her, Mark Winner. Crime Watch Daily has learned Winner once managed and later owned the salon. Leslie shares with Elizabeth the torture so many rape victims endure to tell or to keep quiet. If I tell anybody, I'll never work in my profession again. I knew where this could go. But then also the thought of, if I don't tell someone, he's gonna do this to someone else. Not only that, but it would destroy you from the inside out. Yes, it would. As a rape survivor myself, I will never forget the feelings of filth and just total loss of value in myself. The mm -hmm. feeling of filth is so overwhelming. Um, and six days was how long you waited before you reported to the police. That's not long at all. Still, even then, it was a little shaky. I actually, a male friend of mine called the police and they called me and then I went in. To Leslie's great relief, police head over to the tanning salon and Mark Winner is arrested on suspicion of criminal sexual assault. But Leslie gets a shock a few days later when she sits down for a talk with the felony reviewer on the case. He asked me, why didn't you run to the nearest house? Why didn't you break open the door? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? So the felony reviewer who decided he would not charge him with criminal sexual assault. How did you feel when you found out he was just being charged with battery? Enraged, um, to be honest. It, the justice system failed me so miserably. A disappointed Leslie is present for every hearing when Winner appears before a judge. He would yell at me as he walked out of the courtroom. She's a liar and he had absolutely zero remorse. What was it like seeing him again? I was grateful to have my mom by my side the whole time. She was terrified of how her daughter was going to get hurt. But she was there every moment by my side. Then the shocking news. Mark Winner will get probation and not serve another day behind bars. That makes Leslie feel violated all over again. They come to me and tell me that they want to only go for two years probation and he's willing to plead guilty. I'm like, wait. Two years, he gets his freedom entirely. And the craziest part about it, though, is at the end, when he left angry, enraged that he had, a, you know, they pleaded guilty to battery. Leslie is crushed, telling Elizabeth she's terrified he'll go on to rape other women. Now, at least four other women are claiming Winner did the same thing to them after walking free. I couldn't stop him. Even though, granted, the system failed me, I still couldn't stop him. And since I couldn't stop him, these other women unfortunately got raped. Mark Winner's criminal record reportedly includes convictions for DUI, driving with a revoked license, theft, and possession of cocaine. One witness reportedly told investigators that he and Winner would cruise the streets late nights looking for intoxicated women and lure them into the car with, quote, free tans, drugs, and alcohol. Mark Winner and the Mark Winners out there, they get emboldened. When they get off with a slap on the wrist, basically, oh yeah, I can go out and do that again. 
His current charges of four violent sexual assaults range between 2009 and 2015, and that includes the kidnapping of one woman he allegedly brought to his mother's home and raped at knife point. And now Leslie says insult is again added to injury to see Mark Winner walk free again after posting bond on his four pending rape charges. He changed my life forever. Um, but, you know, I hate saying that because that means he still has control and power over me, and he doesn't. Brian Mitchell changed my life forever, but that doesn't mean he has power or control over exactly. me. Exactly. Elizabeth decided to track down Mark Winner at his Chicago home. Hello? Hello? Mark? Mark Winner? Nobody answered. This is his gate right here, and it's locked up pretty tight. And you can see right here, he's got a security cam. So if he's at home, then he can probably see us and he doesn't want to talk to us. And this is also his garage right here that we've been watching all morning, and we haven't seen him leave the house. Mark! Mark Winner! I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'd like to ask you a few questions. He may be free, but he's keeping a very low profile these days. We figure the last person he wants to see is our Elizabeth Smart. So we still think he is inside, just not willing to speak to us. Winner's attorney sent Crime Watch Daily this statement. We prefer to try these cases in the courtroom. At that time, we believe people will see these charges are without merit. We did get a good look at Winner the day he posted bond to get out of jail. He wears an ankle monitor and is under a 7 p.m. curfew. But he was too busy running away to answer any questions. Ah. But count on it. He will return soon to the halls of justice to answer some deadly serious questions before a judge. I'm so grateful that you are sharing your story. Do you find it at all cathartic or do you just feel it's just kind of hard and kind of painful. I not only on camera, I'm saying my name. I'm saying his name. I'm letting my face be seen. I'm not letting my voice be distorted because the reality is, is that we shouldn't have to hide. They should.